Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful coffee break. Welcome back to the crime field trip. We're going to head right into our second session. Many of us listening today are medical educators, but every discipline has been affected by the pandemic. Every discipline has had to work creatively to find solutions to keep their students learning and their businesses running. Everyone has had to innovate, make compromises, find surprising silver linings, and learn very quickly on the job. Today, we have gathered four speakers. They are educators, scholars, and leaders from the fields of music, yoga, science, and theater arts. We're here today to listen to their stories and learn from their experiences. If you weren't in our first session, uh, I just want to make sure everyone's clear on the fact that we are welcoming you to join the conversation. Please do join the conversation. If you have questions for the speakers, ask them using the Q&A tool and upvote other people's questions. We've reserved plenty of time for your questions after we've heard from all four of our panelists and we'll be pulling questions from the Q&A tool. If you have general comments or would like to share thoughts or resources, then do use the chat tool, but know that we won't be monitoring the chat for questions. With no further ado, I would like to welcome Heather to the spotlight. Heather is owner of Siren Song Enterprises, offering voice lessons, yoga, and teaching space. Heather, take it away. This meeting's being recorded. Um, why is this not letting me? There we go, that's better, thank you. All right, good morning, my name is Heather Ann, and I am a singer, I sing, I did sing regularly with Golden Gate Radio Orchestra. And I've done musical theater in the area, most recently with um, San Jose Lyric Theater as Lori in Oklahoma. And lately over this year, if you want to hear me sing, uh, you got to get on Instagram. <laughs> um, I, I like to do little live sessions with practice sessions or throw up little videos and things, um, just all really informal. I've been teaching for over 10 years, um, three years under my own business. My voice lessons I offer in now in sessions and they culminate in a recital and this is going to be kind of important later. Um, sessions are around two-ish months, maybe a little more. I also now offer personalized yoga for individuals and small groups on Zoom, uh, small groups being at most three people. And I'm really excited. Um, we're about to launch a virtual musical theater summer camp this summer uh, of, with a friend of mine who teaches dance and uh, piano. So a little overview, what did pivoting mean for me? We'll look at uh, what did pivoting actually look like, the timeline, um, what lessons were learned. Um, so if we're just talking about meaning, it literally meant survival. I had to get online, I had to start teaching online, or my business was going to go away. It was just, I was, everything I had worked for was going to disappear. Um, it also, because of my session plans, students pr uh, and families prepay and they get a certain number of lessons and a certain number of makeups. They don't get to carry over. I don't do, I don't do anything like that anymore. And it culminates in this recital. And when all this started to happen, we were maybe two weeks from our recital for that session because um, things started to unravel about the beginning of March and I think our recital was set for March 24th and let's get into what did it look like so phase one that I'll go over was actually pre shelter in place I went through kind of two iterations and phase two was post um, full shelter in place so here's our timeline on the 12th, San Mateo County order prohibiting gatherings of 250 plus prompted me to ask for volunteers on Facebook, which turned out to be earlier than I thought I had done. I thought I'd done this later. I was going back through my posts and I apparently asked for this on the 12th um, to practice my remote teaching with me. I implemented a new cleaning and distancing protocol in my studio. I abandoned my plans for small group yoga in the studio that I had been working on and um, starting to promote voice for yoga teachers workshops. Um, I, the next day, made arrangements for a new recital format 
And then the day after that, shared those plans with families to pivot to a recital in a self-tape audition style affair. So in my studio, there was enough space that students could walk in, hit their mark in front of a, a large blank wall I keep for this purpose. They would be far enough away from the piano player over here, and then I would be over here. And each family would have a 15 minute slot, so no families would cross contaminate each other. This is what we thought at the time. And uh, on that same day, I also attended a National Association Teachers of Singing webinar presented by five veteran remote voice teachers and coaches. So actually, this has been a thing in the voice teaching community for a long time, though it was pr it's still pretty divided. There are a lot of teachers who are still really pushing hard to be able to get back into the studio with their students in person. Um, I decided on the platform, Zoom, because it was free and it seemed like it had lower barriers for students. I briefly considered voicelessons.com, which is specifically designed for this, but there was cost involved. Um, it, it, the advantages it was gonna give weren't, weren't gonna be worth it at the time. Um, the next day, which was the 15th, a Sunday, I cleaned and prepared my home offer, office and collected and set up equipment. So I had to get my laptop. Um, I luckily already had a, a nice blue Yeti mic uh, that had been collecting dust. I pulled out my amp from the studio so that I could hear my students better so that I wasn't hearing them on tinny, terrible laptop speakers um, and got my piano set up. And just as I did all that, the next day the shelter in place order happened. So I had to jump in the deep end. I suspended and canceled lessons um, for one week so that I could transition and practice with family and colleagues who had volunteered. I announced plans for catching up on lessons and holding the recital online. Um, over the next week, I did those things. I also began transitioning Acuity away from, which I'd been using for my renters that I'd shared the space with in order to use it for onboarding new students. Um, I began practicing online teaching, working out the kinks. Um, I also had to build instructions for students around equipment and, and settings. So documents on like, you need this and you need this setting and you need this setting, which is helpful, but you always ultimately end up having to walk them through all of their menus in their computer and in, in their app. Um, on the 20th, I held um, some office hours on Zoom if people wanted to check equipment for s equipment. Uh, and then we get into, we taught our first official voice lesson on the 24th when we were supposed to be having the recital. <laughs> And um, by the 31st, we had our first official voice recital on Zoom. Um, and at that point, um, I'd been trolling the, there I belonged to a bunch of fa voice teacher Facebook forums. Um, and at that point, I not only was trolling them for information, but I started sharing back information that I had learned. So it was 19 days from start to finish of transition. And um, all, by the way, while watching a two and a half year old, three to four days a week uh, because my niece uh, was previously being cared for by my in-laws who were over 65. So we, and her father is a grocery um, store manager and mom was in banking. So they weren't working from home. So we took over that. It, it was cool. <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot. Major lessons learned. Um, I actually found I have ADHD and I actually found that this setup was really ADHD friendly. Um, that's kind of niche. So I'll, um, I can answer questions about that if, if you want. Um, I found that it, inc uh, an increase in student independence, um, it particularly in their, in their singing, um, because I, I, ha I was able to let go of feeling like I needed to play for them because I, I can't play for them while uh, through Zoom because of the latency. So they have to rely on tracks. I have to rely on cueing and then they sing back to me. Um, and it's actually been really, really good for their growth. Um, in particular, ear training. So they're not overly relying on me for uh, support or su for support from the piano. Um, it is slower. Ear training is much slower and harder for sure. But I, I think I'm thinking maybe it's actually it's actually better, and will inform how I teach when we are back in person. Um, 
I can watch my students more closely because again, I'm not buried in the music. Um, being on a screen, they don't necessarily have to look at themselves or have as much of a sense of like, I'm in their face, like really staring at them. Um, and so things that I thought would be harder to teach or address actually became easier because I now had another sense to rely on, not just my ears, but I could rely more heavily on my sight of what they were doing. So things like breathing or postural issues. Um, and it bridged, bridged distances. I have students and audience members in the recitals that uh, I would never have had otherwise. I get to teach um, my niece and my best friend's daughter who are out in the Sacramento Valley. I have students up and down the peninsula. Um, students are able to have parents uh, or grandparents and family members and friends who aren't local attend their recitals. Um, I had like on our last recital a couple weeks ago, we had 20 to 30 people in the room, including like five performers. Um, and a lot of those accounts had multiple people. Um, it was more than I would have been able to do out of my studio or trying to, to potentially find a place um, and do it more cheaply and more easily. And I, and I love that they can share it further afield with their, um, with their, loved ones so it's something i think broadcasting recitals is something even once we start doing recitals live that's definitely something i will keep um i learned i can adapt more quickly than i thought though adrenaline urgency of the situation may have helped with that um it reduces barriers for students travel um time my attendance has been significantly better <laughs> though some of that may be this model uh, which was actually fairly new i'd only been doing it for about a year less than a year when this happened of these sessions culminating in a recital some of it's that some of it's that there isn't anything else for them to do they can't go on trips and cancel lessons for things like that or have soccer games or whatever um i think it also reduced that that barrier reduces some of that anxiety about singing in front of people there's there's more of a sense of you're maybe just singing for yourself. I've watched them really bloom in confidence, which has been great. Um, I still hate and struggle with technology and particularly with onboarding new students and building new offerings is actually a lot more work for me now. It was a lot easier to just say, show up to the studio at this time and you know, I'll swipe your credit card or send you an invoice and, and then you know, and you can sign a paper and we're all done. Um, I have to deal with building things in Acuity and it's not native for me. Um, and then success really came down to embracing the change um, and jumping in and not looking back. Um, yeah, I watched so many of my colleagues through the forums from the beginning holding on to the idea that we would be back in the studio with our students before the year was out. Um, but I'm I'm really glad that you know previous experiences taught me to not resist the change, but to surrender to it, to let go of what was and embrace the next thing in front of me that needed to be done. Again, that survival piece. Um, I'm not going to try to anticipate what people want to know in terms of settings on your <laughs> on Zoom or things like that. So if you have questions um, about more specific things. Um, you can ask that in the Q and A and I think that's about it. Yeah. Oh, I was going to share. There we go. I know I had one more slide. Um, I'd love to hear from you if you have any other, um, questions about other things you want more details. Um, there's my email, my number and my website, and please, please feel free to get in touch. I could talk about singing and yoga and all these things all day long. <laughs> That's why I teach it. Thank you so much, Heather. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. We are going to move on to our next speaker, who is Zeke, Zeke Kossauer. So Zeke is the leadership program co-leader at the Exploratorium Teacher Institute. Take it away, Zeke. So hi, my name is Zeke Kossover, and uh, I've been teaching for 21 years before coming to the Exploratorium a few years ago. 
And I'm super familiar with the idea of having to teach online. All of our teachers had to switch to teaching online at the Teacher Institute at the Exploratorium. We help teachers do more hands-on activities in the classroom. And I particularly work with uh, our teacher induction program, which is for teachers who are new to the profession. But as it turns out, my work with teachers has spread rather broadly. Um, my wife teaches uh, physiology online for City College of San Francisco. And my sister-in-law is the director of telemedicine for UCSF. So it's been you know, uh, really spread to everything uh, very quickly. And you know, the Exploratorium is a hands-on kind of place and we're a hands-on kind of program. And so switching to online has been very complicated for us because it's really sort of against our you know, moral fiber to be like trying to transfer to doing things um, electronically. So we came up, we tried to come up with new ways of doing that kind of electronic work, even through distance. I mean, instead of having it be electronic work, have us bring that hands-on through distance. And it's been very complicated because uh, California rules, well, as well as just a, you know, a need for equity, has been that the, you can't really rely on any set of students to have any materials that you would like. So we spent a lot of time racking our brains trying to figure out ways that we could have students do activities and experiments at home. Uh, because it just couldn't know for sure what any student have. Would a student have baking soda to do a chemistry activity? Would they have vinegar to do something else? Uh, would they have marbles to roll down an incline? It turns out one of the things that I always have around my house is string. And lots of people, the only string they have are shoelaces. So like trying to get our heads around what would be available to everyone took a lot of time. But what really worked was we suddenly realized we could embrace all the different things that people would have. So for example, an activity that we've been doing for a long time with teachers involves, um, and hopefully with their students, involves trying to figure out how to clean a tarnished penny. So this is a nice new shiny penny, isn't it lovely? Ooh, coppery. And then over here we have a tarnished penny. This penny became tarnished by sitting in the air and, uh, and it's formed a layer of copper oxide on the outside. And if you try to put this in water and scrub it with soap and water, you know, it stays the same, doesn't get shiny. So in a typical classroom with this, we might set out three or four different chemicals and you put them in and you see what happens. But, you know, we couldn't be sure that a student would have vinegar at home to use. We couldn't be sure a student might ha would have like hydrogen peroxide at home to see if that would work. Um, Dawn or anything in particular. But what it turns out you can rely on is that they'll have something at home to try. So instead of just trying one or two things, we did things like, here's ketchup. What happens when you put it in ketchup? Here's soy sauce. What happens if you put it in soy sauce? Because everybody has some condiment at home. And so they can each try whatever they have in their house to see what would happen. And then we had students submit their answers on a Google document. What did you try? How did it turn out? And it turns out that some of them make it very shiny. For example, it's not quite as shiny as the original one, but it's pretty shiny. This one out of the ketchup after about 10 minutes in ketchup. I'll show you the other one in a bit. Um, it gets pretty shiny. On the other hand, soy sauce. Soy sauce eh, stays about the same. So what are the different things that you can have that we can make, make this big spreadsheet. We could look up what's in every one of the condiments and finally track down what are the factors that you need to make it work. And it's hard because it turns out it's more than one thing. Like, I'll give you a little secret, vinegar is actively involved, but vinegar by itself is not enough. It takes another ingredient that ketchup surprisingly has both of them in. And then there are lots of other things that make no difference at all. And so we took an activity that had actually been, let's face it, only in an okay activity when it was in person, to making it a fantastic activity online. Because in a class of 130, you'll probably try 50 different condiments. And with those 50 different condiments, then you can really narrow down. And so it becomes a better activity than it was before. And we'll take that with us as we get back into classrooms, because we'll go back to having that kind of activity where we'll send students home and say, everyone try what you have 
and put it in online. And that's just gonna be a kind of like a new way of thinking about chemistry for lots of different things. So we're super excited about that idea. Another idea we've become very excited about is trying to figure out ways to take things that you already have in your house and reuse them. So there aren't that many things that's in every person's home, but there is one thing and that's this thing. This is a mirror and here I am, I'm Zeke, but right now I can talk to you from mirror land. And we do a lot of activities with mirrors in physics classes. They're super interesting, but one of the things that is often never really taught in science class is why do things look backwards in mirrors? Why does the text of my shirt look left to right in a mirror instead, I'm sorry, right to left in a mirror instead of left to right? Why is it inverted? And we'd ask our students to, we asked our students to, to, to send in why they thought that that was and lots of great, great, great explanations. My favorite one of which is that you have two eyes and your two eyes are side by side. And so that's why it looks swapped left to right instead of, you know, up and down as well. Um, and a great response from another student, which was, you know, just close one eye, still looks swapped left to right. Couldn't pro probably be that. And so then we can come up with a set of activities that we can give students like a little script. They can go look in their mirror of choice. Um, are not around other students. So they'll probably be willing to, you know, do activities. Because are you willing to do something silly? When you were a teenager, how willing were you to do something silly in front of a mirror in front of your classmates? No, everyone stands just like this. Now, that's what you get with a whole bunch of teens. But get them in their own bathroom by themselves say maybe you want to video yourself doing those activities you don't have to but if you would like to oh my god have all sorts of exciting things and so let's go through like one of those little scripts so i've got my mirror set up here and i'm going to point that way in the mirror and you might be asking yourself how do you think mirror zeke is pointing well it's a little hard to try to say because like is mirror Zeke going to the left? Is it my left or mirror Zeke's left? But we can do something simple here. We know the directions. And in my house, that way is left. So I can put this little sign and that direction is west over there. And so if I point west, which way is mirror Zeke pointing? Mirror Zeke is pointing to the west as well. Wait a minute, is mirror Zeke actually doing something different? Oh, let's, let's, get, let's continue on. Here is, so if west is that way, east is this way. So if mirror Zeke points to the, if real Zeke points to the east, mirror Zeke also points to the east. Strangely, not swapped left to right. Well, let's keep going. If I point up, mirror Zeke also points up. If I point, down, mirror Zeke also points down. What's the reversal here? Like if everywhere I point, mirror Zeke also points the same way, what's, what's being reversed? Well, there is one other direction I haven't picked yet. I haven't tried. And that's north and south. If west and east are that way, then north is that way. So now I'm going to point north. Let's see which way mirror Zeke points. I'm going to point north. Mirror Zeke points south. That's the reversal. If I point south, mirror Zeke points north. The reversal isn't actually left and right. It's not up and down. It's in and out. And this is something that you can just give a little script, have students just like read through it and suddenly see that the problem is, is that mirrors don't flip left, right? They fl flip in and out. And if you flip in and out, then you turn writing backwards. When have you ever seen writing from the back side? That's the problem. You're just not used to it. But if you were to take a t-shirt and look at the writing from the reverse side, then 
you would see writing being reversed. And for example, here is this letter F. If I turn the F backwards so that you can see it from the back side, now the letter F looks reversed left to right. We'll do one more thing with that. Here, I'm gonna put this in so you can see it in the mirror. Jump out of the way and then what do you think you'll see? Will it be backwards? Will it be forwards? How do you think it'll look in the mirror? All right, let's give it a try and see what you get. Oh, wow. It looks the front way in the mirror. Two flips back to left. This is the back side. Then that does the back side. Looks forward again. All right. That's all my time. I'll put up a link. You can find lots of information. We have lots and lots of free activities available online. Your tax dollars at work. Please click on those and go see all the cool stuff that we have at the Exploratorium for you. And when we open back up in the beginning of July, love to see you at the Expo. Thank you, Zeke. Thank you so much, Zeke. All right. Our next panelist is Katie Scott. Katie Scott is the STEM integration manager from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Super excited to hear from you today, Katie. Hi there, thanks for having me. Um, and I'll go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, so similar to, to Zeke, I actually work in the education division at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and so that's specifically what I'll talk about today. Um, and my, like, uh, as you just heard, I'm the STEM integration manager. So my role is um, I work with pre-K through 12th grade students and teachers. And my role is really thinking about how to integrate science, technology, engineering, and math into what we do. Um, and part of my job is distance learning. So um, I've had some job security over the past year, which has been nice. Um, so at the aquarium in our education division, um, we have a specific goal, a specific mission um, just in education. Um, and, and that goal is we're really trying to develop a diverse group of young leaders who are inspired, science literate, confident, and ready to act as agents of ocean conservation. That's our goal. Um, and in doing that, we work with preschool through 12th grade students. Um, we also work with the adults in their lives. So their teachers, their educators, their caregivers, and their mentors. Um, and historically, um, for the, we've been doing this for the past 30 years, um, what we do in order to reach that goal is we really focus on research-based uh, approaches. Um, and so what we do is we focus on um, helping students empathize with wild animals. Um, we know from research that that's a first step toward conservation when a student has empathy for an animal um, or a pet. So we, we do a lot of work with that. Um, we also know that having significant life experiences in nature will build a conservation ethic. So we spend a lot of time taking kids boogie boarding and surfing and just going outdoors with them. Um, we also support students in practicing authentic science. So we want them to actually go out and do field science and do real research projects, not busy work. Don't, we don't want them to practice science. We want them to do science. Um, so we support them in that endeavor. Um, we also know from our evaluations that the longer uh, term a connection is with a student, the deeper that impact is. So all of our programs or most of our programs are at least a year long with students. Um, lots of them are much longer. So we engage with students for five, six, seven years um, and we really to really see that um, uh, that conservation agency being built within them. Um, and, and lastly, a big focus of our programs is really centering relationships. So we focus on students building relationships with their peers, building relationships with our staff and our volunteers. Um, and it really becomes part of their identity and who they are to be an ocean conservationist. Um, so this is how we've always built all of our programs. Um, so when uh, we closed, um, we closed on March 12th of 2020. We still haven't opened yet, but we're opening next month. Yay. Um, but when, when we closed on, uh, on March 12th, we had this challenge of how do we do all of that um, when we're not in person, when we can't take kids in person in a big group collectively outdoors to go boogie boarding, to go do science and things like that. Um, so the first thing that we did was actually, um, we've been doing distance learning at the aquarium for about seven years, but just really, really, it's a really small part of our program. Um, we've been using Zoom for a really long time. We had tested other platforms in Zoom uh, really worked for us because it was so easy to use for our teachers and students. Um, 
And so when uh, we closed, we had some experience in distance learning. Um, and one of the things that was actually really lucky was that we had just started developing a new program. We were working with the U uh, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, actually, um, to create a program for students in hospitals who couldn't leave the hospital. So we were looking at how do we develop this program for kids who can't get outside. Um, and so we had just started uh, going down that route. And one of the things we started doing was we were testing a, a platform called Thinkific, which allows us to create kind of interactive online courses. And so we had started testing that with some homeschool audiences um, with the goal of using that platform for hospital students. Um, and then the pandemic hit and suddenly all of our students can't get outside. You know, all of them were kind of in the same situation that we had been working with these hospital kids around. Um, and so what, what that work uh, allowed us to do is really pivot very quickly. And so within three weeks of closing, we actually released um, our first free self-paced online courses um, on our website, free to the public. Um, since then, we've released 13 courses. Four of them are in Spanish. Um, so that was the first thing that we did. Um, we also, um, uh, once it was became clear that like we were going to be in, in this kind of shelter in place pandemic for more than just a couple of months, um, we started, we have programs in the summer and after school for teens and teachers. And so we uh, started kind of redeveloping those in a blended model. And so what we were doing was we were doing these live Zoom sessions, and then we were also creating, uh, similar to the self-paced online courses, we were creating these online courses to supplement those live Live Zoom sessions. So we'd have live Zoom sessions with our uh, uh, teens and teachers. And then between our meetings, they would be doing some work on their own. Um, and then that worked so well for us in the summer of 2020 um, that when we relaunched our field trips in the school year, we used that same model where we have a one hour live Zoom session and then, and then students are given an online course to complete either before or after that Zoom session. Um, and we're going to continue to offer those online courses through the rest of 2021. So I want to talk a little bit more deeply about a couple of those things. Um, specifically, first, I want to talk a little bit about our self-paced online courses and really thinking, going back to those research-backed strategies I talked about that we try to do in all of our programs, how did we do that with these online courses? Um, so we've developed two to three courses per grade band, so pre-K two, uh, third through fifth grade, middle school and high schoolers. Um, we've also created a, a course for caregivers. Um, and when we initially created these, we were thinking that these were for parents because so many students were at home and like we were hearing from parents, like, I don't know what to do with my kid, like I need something for them. So we initially created this for uh, students to be using at home. And then we also got feedback from parents of, you know, I want to be able to support my students better and I don't really know how. And so we created a, a, another course specifically for caregivers of kids seven and younger. Um, and so in these courses, um, all, all of the elementary courses are available in Spanish, as is our caregiver course, because um, for the most part, we're seeing that those students have less access to, if, uh, if they speak Spanish at home, they have, they're less likely to speak English um, uh, uh, and they need more support at home. So we wanted to make sure that, that um, whatever language they're speaking at home, they can um, get supported. And for us in Monterey, um, the majority of, uh, of our folks locally speak either English or Spanish. So we focus on English and Spanish. Um, and these courses are designed uh, to connect students to the outdoor spaces accessible to them. So the idea is that these are digital courses, but they're more like um, an, an instigator. So there's a video or an activity that you watch and you practice on your computer, and then you go outside and do it. Um, and we also recognize that some students maybe don't have as much accessibility to the outside. So we also created um, options for a window biologist. So what can you do just sitting at your window? What can you see? What data can you collect as a window biologist? Um, and so these courses do things like um, you'll learn how our scientists take data about otter activities. And so you'll watch some videos and take some data about what the otters are doing. And then you'll go outdoors and do something similar for an insect or a bird and take data about what you see that insect or bird doing. Um, and we do that with students as young as, as five years old. Um, the other thing we did with these courses is, um, again, we're trying to engage students in authentic science. So we're having them do science that real scientists do and practice that data collection, that data analysis. Um, it's not, you know, it's not just, it's not about um, learning about science, it's about actually doing the science. 
Um, and the courses were designed because, you know, we know that this long term connection is important. So the courses are actually designed for students to take three to five days to complete them. So, you know, doing a couple hours every day that they should actually be engaged with them for a longer period of time, um, which is a little bit different than a lot of other distance learning situations where we want students to be coming back for a few days. Um, and one of the things that actually surprised me when we did this is you can see here, this is one of the images from one of our courses for uh, kindergarten through second grade students. And this is one of our staff members, Athena, who's having you move your arms like the kelp. Um, and, and what we found, which was really great, was that um, our 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 staff is just so good and our educators were so good that we had two or three educators, you know, creating these programs and um, and uh, and they were connecting with the students really, really well. And so students were creating a connection and a relationship with these students, uh, uh, with these, uh, with our staff. So um, since we launched these in April, we've actually had almost 42,000 students enroll in our courses, which we normally see 80,000 students on we created these online courses with the aquarium being closed. We really had no idea how many students would enroll. We expected a couple of thousand. So this really blew us away that we've had this much engagement. And even more so, um, one of the things that's been really encouraging is normally almost 100% of our students are coming from California. And with our online um, courses, we're seeing people from 93 different countries. About half of our enrollments are from California, but the other half are from all over the world. And we have users from every state in the US. So that's really expanded um, you know, our, our footprint. Um, we haven't been able to, we're, we're in the process of developing an evaluation for these programs, um, but we have not evaluated them yet. Um, but we do have some anecdotal information of people just really being um, engaged with them. <clears throat> and then really briefly, I also want to talk about um, our online field trips. So those are our self-paced online courses. We also have online field trips, which are those live Zoom sessions. And then um, they're supplemented with these um, online self-paced courses. So this is an example, <clears throat> a screenshot from one of our online Zoom sessions. And what we really try to do with these classes is similar to what Zeke was talking about. We want them to be super interactive for students. So for example, um, we show them these close-up images and we have students um, draw scientific illustrations of animals that they see. Um, we've also found that um, we're using GIFs or GIFs as the kids say um, for a lot of our programming because it allows you to see really cool things very close up. Um, but it's also more accessible um, because what we're finding is that we have students who have low bandwidth issues. We have students coming to field trips from the car. I had a student who was sitting in a dentist chair and a field trip. Um, and so they're coming from all over. And so we wanna make sure that they can access whatever it is we're throwing out. Um, and so rather than videos, which kind of take up a little bit more bandwidth, uh, we focus on these in interactive GIFs. Um, we also, with our programming, our live programming, we have, um, what we do is rather than calling on one student in a Q&A, we have all students physically respond to us at once. So we have them, let's all act like a penguin. Everybody waddle like a penguin. And so we can see all 30, 40 kids waddling like a penguin. So we get that engagement. Um, and then we also focus on empathy building um, in these courses. And so, for example, with our younger students, we actually have them bring a stuffed animal with them, and then they pretend they're a veterinarian and they do a checkup on their stuffed animal. Um, so those are some of the things we do. Um, and then just really quickly, these are some of the stats we have from those online field trips. Um, so we could offer way more. There's a demand for way more field trips, but we had to lay off about 40% of our staff. So this is really all we have the bandwidth to offer. Um, and again, similarly, these are really, really well received. We have 93% of our teachers who are saying that they're very or extremely engaging for their students. Um, so that's what I had to share with you today. Thank you so very much, Katie. Our last speaker, but Definitely not least is Joy Meads, who is joining us um, from the American Conservatory Theater. She's the director of dramaturgy and new works. Joy, we look forward to hearing your story. I believe you are muted. Oh, am I unmuted oh. now? Now we can hear you. Okay, great. Oh, and I realize I'm so sorry, my microphone is not plugged in. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, okay. And oops, is this working? Yeah, we see you. Okay, great. great. So here I'm working for, uh, uh, sorry, I am 
I work at American Conservatory Theater, which is the largest professional theater in Northern California. Um, we're in, we see ourselves as an essential gathering place that brings artists and communities together to inspire and provoke. And we've got a range of programming. We've got two theaters, the historic Geary Theater, um, which is a thousand seat space in downtown San Francisco and the Strand Theater, which is a 300 seat space a few blocks away. We also have a variety of programming um, for uh, training programs for youth. We have um, arts residencies in just about every public school in San Francisco. Um, we have arts residencies for uh, homeless and marginally home um, youth. We have uh, community partnerships with a number of different communities and um, uh, and we also have a accredited MFA training program. So we do a lot. Um, in early March, I would say things at the theater were going just about as well as they possibly could. We had two plays running um, that were as uh, that were as good art. I mean, that as artistically successful as anything that I've done in my 20 years of work in the theater. In our um, Strand Theater, we were running a play called Gloria by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins. And in our Geary Theater, we were running a play called Tony Stone by uh, Lydia Diamond. Both of them were receiving rave reviews from audiences. You know, theaters were, um, demand was high for them initially until we started to see an impact from COVID as the news came out. You know, and then of course, as we learn more and more about the pandemic, basically what we learned is that COVID-19 is more or less um, uh, communicated through theater, right? So people gathering together in poorly, in, in, in indoor spaces is bad, right? Um, amplified speech, singing, dancing, movement is bad. All of these things that are pretty much intrinsic to our art form do not work. So of course we had to close, um, we had to close down all of our shows and um, which was truly heartbreaking. Uh, this picture you can see here, I wish I, I wish you could all come and see the Tony Stone that was. It's the result of eight years of work, actually, this production, and we had to close it on opening night. The set's still in our theaters. There's still a couple of unclaimed opening night gifts on the green room table. It's like Pompeii in there. Um, and so, as I said, we see ourselves as an essential gathering place. Um, and that a lot of what we do is we create connection between people. And so what does that look like online? Um, so we had to pivot more or less immediately. Um, and, you know, we, we had to cancel the shows for the remainder of our season, but we did have our MFA students who were still, you know, uh, pursuing a degree and we had a, a, a um, responsibility to educate them. And so we moved to, uh, so we, the Monday after everything closed, we were supposed to start rehearsals for um, a play called In Love and Warcraft. Um, for our MFA class. And the director of that production, Peter J. Quo, was like, you know what, I think I can do this over Zoom. And so he um, re very quickly pivoted and this became a Zoom production. And Peter artfully used things like um, creating um, points of eye, fo of eye focus, right? Like little post-its on the wall of the actors living spaces that they should look at to try and create the illusion of a kind of the connection that you would see in real life. Also, you can see that we used, you know, kind of tricks like, you know, um, we would find similar wall spaces. They had a day where they just went through the entire, everybody's apartment and looked at every single location that could possibly, um, support uh, a scene or two. And they, you know, and we found places that might kind of match. So we could create a theatrical illusion by, you know, using similar, um, uh, you know, pieces of set decoration on the wall, right? Here's another scene, right, where um, we create, we created the illusion that these two characters are sitting on the same couch and talking to one another, right? Um, we also had to ship, um, 
lighting equipment, sound equipment to each of the actors so that we could have a pretty uniform and high quality um, sound that came through. And I thought that, you know, this was kind of extraordinarily successful in creating the illusion of a, of a production that was more or less similar to what you might experience in real life with a couple of additions. There's a part of this play that actually takes place in an, uh, an online multiplayer game. So actually we were able to capture video of, of um, actually playing an, a game of the kind that was uh, referenced in the play and playing that video during that section. So that was great. But the thing that we found out is that it actually was incredibly intrusive in these actors' living spaces, right? Like some of them had family members and roommates that were not allowed to basically use their home during the time of each run of the play. Also, um, li the live aspect of it made it really tricky for, um, you know, if there were any kind of Zoom errors, as of course there often are, right? We really, um, it was very easy for the entire, to have to, have, to, to have to pause the production, right? Repeatedly. We've came up with some solutions, some ways to stabilize um, the connectivity issues. So we, we came up with some recommendations for the next play that we did, which is a play called Blood Wedding. This is also an MFA production. Um, and again, this is one where we, uh, you know, we use the actors' living spaces. Um, and this is stylized, right? It was performed in black and white. We used a software called vMix in association with um, Zoom. And so, you know, and so we created this and then, and we had come up with a kind of list of questions to ask everyone and some recommendations for best practices about how to keep their, um, their online, uh, their uh, connection as stable as possible. We were able to beef up a couple of people's uh, connection who needed it. And so the connection issues were smoother in this play, uh, but it was a 12 person production, you know, and um, it still was extremely unwieldy to, uh, to make sure we could run it smoothly every night. We would have a video backup and often we would have to use that video backup, unfortunately. Um, but we also, we started working a little bit more with recorded contact. Uh, contact. So um, as part of this production, we had, we were able to have two actors who were potted together, who lived together. Um, to perform a, um, a kind of salsa dance routine um, that we recorded safely on one of our stages that was used as part of this um, production. So we were able to incorporate a little bit more movement. Um, but after that, we decided that we really did need to move away from this, uh, that actually the live experience in this format was not worth the technical headaches that it created. So we we wound up pivoting more towards um, using Zoom as a as a tool, but pre pre recording, pre capturing. And I'd actually love to share with you a little bit of a video of a production of Arms and the Man. It's a reading production of Arms and the Man that we recently recorded. Um, uh, it's directed by Coleman Domingo, who's a really wonderful um, actor, director. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the film of Ma Rainey that uh, was recently out, but he was a major star in that. And here I'm going to share a quick video. Um, share sound optimizer video clip. Here we go. Just a quick map. So we're starting to use a little bit more of techniques of um, television production. Um, great. Uh, in this, um, so here we go. Let me just. Here's this other young lady. Listening at the door, probably. I will prove that that at least is a calumny. Mm. <clears throat> ah! Judge her, Blunchley. Judge her, you, the cool, impartial man. Judge the eavesdropper. 
I mustn't judge her. I once listened myself outside a tent where there was a mutiny brewing. It's all a question of the degree of provocation. My life was at stake. My love was at stake. I am not ashamed. <laughs> your love? You mean your curiosity? My love. Stronger than anything you can feel, even for your chocolate cream soldier. What does that mean? It means that she- Oh, no, 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 I remember the ice pudding poultry font girl. Excuse me, excuse my- Anyway, you get a you get a sense of that. So, so we're starting to try and use some of the techniques of um, of television in, in quick cuts and and things of that kind. And um, and that it's been really fun. And I think we've gotten some really um, vibrant productions from that. Some some great experiences. Uh, and it's really a way to keep our audience engaged. Finally, we're moving towards you know one of the things that I think we think a lot about in theater is that. The ability of, I think what is core to our art form is that we can create a sense of connection, community, communion, right? And so the next thing that we're trying to do is we're going to be doing an interactive one person show called Communion, where our goal is through Zoom screens in live performance with this one actor um, that we are going to try and create a virtual form of communion online. And that's going to be going up in June. I have a rehearsal for it later today, so I hope you all will appreciate it. Uh, will come and join us and see that play. Um, finally, I just want to say that, you know, working for the not-for-profit theater, like, we, there is no fat in any of our budgets. I've been working in the not-for-profit theater for 20 years, and I think we're brilliant problem solvers. You know, we have a show must go on ethos. You know, we know how to, I worked at a theater once where there was a rattlesnake hidden on part of the stage that was found, it was an outdoor theater that was found during the show by a stagehand and was um, discovered and removed without the audience ever knowing. <laughs> like you would not believe our ability to problem solve. Um, but of course, we, uh, we, there's not an inch of fat in any of our budgets and we've lost around $5 million of income um, thanks to this pandemic and, uh, you know, while we're really happy to say that we have reached broad audiences internationally with our work, which is exciting and wonderful, we haven't um, we haven't been able to find an experience yet that where people, you know, uh, where it's the same kind of value um, for our attendees um, as a live experience would. And so our 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 ticket revenue has kind of plummeted during this time. Um, so, you know, as we hope to, to continue and to demonstrate, like, as we come back in person, which is going to happen in January of this next year, uh, that we really hope to demonstrate, um, again, the, I think, the incomparable experience of, of being in communion with a community of strangers gathered to share a journey. Um, the support of anybody who can afford it is incredibly valuable and much appreciated. And I think I've gone a bit over, so I apologize, but thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Joy. I think we're gonna spotlight everyone so we can put you all up on the screen at the same time. And then open it up for questions. And just to get started, are there um, any questions that you have for each other? After hearing the similar, you know, your stories, are there similarities or differences that you're interested in exploring a little bit more? I, I'm, I, have, I have a question for, um, for Joy, actually. Um, thinking about my own experience with holding live um, performances for my students, mm -hmm. I've done five since the pandemic started, actually. Um, and it makes me wonder if you guys thought or explored um, more, I mean, I know it, maybe it's not the big production value you're used to, but like, like soliloquies, um, yeah. nights of, of like individual one acts or, you know, small vignettes. Cause that's essentially what I do with my students is they eat, they have their own track. They, they performed, you know, they start their own track. I introduce them, they go, um, and the audience, I think the audience gets a lot from it. They do get yeah. that sense of connection. Um, so I'm curious what you, if you guys explored that or thought about that or. 
Yeah, we actually um, are oh, coming up on, um, as I said, a one person show that will be written specifically for, for Zoomer has been by Christopher Chen, who's just a brilliant writer. He is actually a third generation San Franciscan. And, um, and so this is a play, um, I'll just say it's a play about a con artist and it is a play that explores social trust slash the lack thereof. And I think the goal is to try and create a sense of communion uh, uh, despite the largest obstacle possible, right? Which is the presence of a con artist in our mix. But it is gonna be a one, a one person show. And the idea is it's, you know, um, veteran barrier actress, Stacey Ross, performing you know in her home and um with the backup of ACT you know trying to make it uh we've learned a lot about how to make this possible so um so I'm very excited about that and I think it'll be unexpected and delightful and actually hopefully unexpectedly moving so stay tuned for that that's going to be in March and June or May and June sorry <laughs> Thank I you, have Helen. a question, if you don't mind, Helen. Jump in, Pauline. All right. So I heard a couple of you talk about some silver linings about the switch to remote. Um, and I know that in the medical school, there are some as well. Our faculty are raving about A, attendance, which I think one of you mentioned. Um, more students are actually attending class now that they don't have to get out of their pajamas. And B, engagement of the students with the Q&A tools. Now even those who may not speak up in class are engaging um, through chat and asking questions. And so I'm curious to know, like one of the big questions we're grappling with is how are we gonna take these silver linings back into the classroom. So I'd like to hear from each of you if you have an example of one of those silver linings and what your thoughts are on how you could take that lesson that's been learned and translate it back into in-person teaching. Who'd like to take that first? I'll, I'll take it because I've actually, I've, I've thought about this mm -hmm. a lot. Um, again, letting my students be more independent. I was always, I'm not the best piano player and um, and it's, I know it's been a weak spot in my teaching. I, it takes up too much of my attention in the, the, the lesson. And I, but I had a anxiety about using tracks that it was cheating or that it wasn't as good and I'm over it. <laughs> I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to bring the tracks in. Um, I'm going to make, try to make them work harder to, to, to sing things back to me without having me under them as, I mean, it's a process. It depends on the student, but like, um, taking, taking that in. And as I said before, um, I, I fully intend to set up some kind of camera setup so that they can broadcast to their friends and family who aren't nearby. Um, and, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like there's more, but those are, those are the ones that, that are, are coming to mind is, is, is using, is you definitely like just using tracks, just, um, Maybe not 100% because obviously we'll be preparing not for a recital with a track because I would want to be preparing for a recital with a live accompanist and that's a thing. You need to practice singing with and, and working with somebody, making music and keeping time together. Um, so I would still need to play for them as some part of the process, but um, I would certainly, I think I will be more comfortable using using tracks for sure. I mean, I think like I have been really delighted. So I talked a lot about our production work. Of course, we have so many programs at ACT beyond that. Um, one thing that I've been delighted about is, you know, kind of like our ancillary um, audience engagement programming, conversations around the work, all of that. Our attendance is up. And I actually feel like people are more relaxed, more open and um and there's a kind of lower threshold for entry, I think, when people are in their homes. And also it's easier to attend. So I think we're gonna continue to have like, you know, discussions about the play. We have a, like a little play reading book club that we call Meads Reads. Um, and we're gonna keep that going, you know? And, and I've just been so delighted with the quality of the conversations we've had over this period. It's been um, incredibly moving to see.
I can share a little bit. I think um, similar to, to what other folks have said, um, you know, one of the things obviously is just that broader access. And so, um, for example, we have, we generally provide transportation for our teenagers to come to our programs, um, which is a huge, you know, that's the majority of our budget is spent on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are still some students, depending on where they live, you know, we're in Monterey. So not a lot of people actually live in Monterey. <laughs> so folks are coming from all around um, to come to our programs. And, um, and so what we found is that there's some students who have told us, you know, hey, I always wanted to do this program, but I couldn't get transportation there because I live in Gilroy or somewhere odd and um, and there was no transportation provided and now I can come because it's online and so we've talked a lot about you know how can we continue to have that blended model moving forward and then at the same time we're also balancing you know we recognize that a lot of our programs you know it's different in person you know we're trying to connect students to the outdoors we're trying to connect them to animals and so you know them actually coming here and being able to feed an animal or care for an animal mm -hmm. is really important and what we don't want to do is we don't want to say hey let's stop mo spending money on transportation for kids who can't mm. afford it and just offer them distance learning programs in the future because mm. then then those students are going to have a different experience that maybe isn't the same uh isn't as equitable so we want to we want to kind of keep that in mind but figure out how to balance it is one thing that we're talking about um the other thing that's interesting is we've been doing distance learning for a really long time but um we always try to do it kind of like, you know, we want it to be, you know, awesome and just like our in-person programs and let's have a live animal and we'll have four cameras on this one snail and we'll have three people running the lights and we'll do all this. And what this forced us to do was figure out how to create quality distance learning programs on the cheap. So yeah. like now we can do it like from our homes with very limited supplies and we figured out like, okay, if we use GIFs in this way, if we do this in this way. Um, and so that's been a really big kind of learning curve for us is, okay, we can, we can do this well without all the bells and whistles. I, I imagine it, it may add to accessibility for the students on the other end of the connection too. Exactly, yep. Katie, have you written, written a, we can do this well on the cheap playbook that you can <laughs> distribute? <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> At the Exploratorium, we're super interested in bringing the experiences that some of, you know, the teachers that we work with have had a wide variety of levels of success. Um, and we're trying to find out the things that have worked for some teachers and help more broadly uh, spread those out. And one of the things that we've discovered, as you have just suggested, is that some students who we expected perhaps to struggle are actually really thriving in the online environment. Um, and there are a bunch of reasons for that, but one of the ones is that it is uh, social pressures are real and make it, you know, you know, where you sit in the lunchroom turns out to be just as complicated when you get into lab sessions. And so mm. having this opportunity for kind of the term of art amongst the technical community is uh, back channeled. I'm not super happy with that, but the like that there are multiple ways to communicate with your peers mm. often allows students who feel strong social pressures to be able to be relieved from them. Mm. Um, and we don't want that to, the, the only thing that we're afraid of that is that that doesn't help solve some of the, um, you know, it doesn't help like a student who feels afraid to talk in class we would hope that we could work on their peers so that they wouldn't feel afraid anymore, right? It's not the student's fault that they feel afraid. Um, and that doesn't happen if we just give them an out, if we give the peers an out and take away their, uh, the, you know, say it's okay because at least they can do, they can participate some other way. So there's some sort of happy balance there, but like a lot of the online tools like Padlets and chats and emails and things like that can turn out to be super valuable and we would like to definitely keep doing them. And the other one is comes from my wife who would like me to emphasize. So I mentioned before she teaches physiology for CCSF. Um, and she recorded uh, all of her lectures and now spends most of that time, which would normally be doing that in, um, you know, when she would be giving a lecture, she spends a lot more time in office hours. And the office hours, of course, are much more flexible because people can get to them. You know, at CCSF, very few students are on campus full time, right? So they have jobs and things and maybe they can't make it to the normal times or maybe can't run over to the, uh, to the college. And so now they have a lot more opportunity with that and they have the opportunity to play the lecture at whatever speed. They can play it at half speed if that helps. They can play it at two times speed if that helps. They can search through it <laughs> for markers. And that has been a, a real boon for her students. And I think that that 
kind of thing probably shouldn't go away. I mean, imagine the kids who miss school, they are just screwed in the old days and now they have more opportunities. I also, another part of my job really quickly, sorry, is a new play development. And um, actually, and so I will say at the beginning of this um, pandemic, because it's so hard to have overlapping speech on Zoom, it's so hard to have music on Zoom, and both of those things are very important in the world of play, play development. And so I was pretty, um, I was, uh, I was just depressed at first. And I don't know if it's because we've gotten much better or I've just gotten used to the Zoom, but uh, we found ways to kind of to work around it. And one thing that's been great, just speaking along that idea of like these recorded lectures is that actually it is possible to kind of record rehearsals. And so for the playwright to be able to listen to it again afterwards, when maybe, you know, maybe the first time they hear it, they're mind is buzzing with anxiety about if it's going to work or not and it's a little harder to focus right but to be able to go back and to and to uh re-watch has been very valuable can we talk a little bit about the tools that you've used and maybe the process that you um, went through to select them were these things that you had experience with before the pandemic? Are these things that you had to scramble to find? Um, what were the important factors in choosing those tools? Oh, I'll, I'll go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like typical theater kid, I'm like, I'll go. Um, process, the process was um, very much dictated by, you know, what was at hand um, and budget. And I got lucky. Um, I when I went to this webinar put on by the National Association of Teachers of Singing, um, they went through a number of different um, online platforms. Like I mentioned, VoiceLessons.com, which has um, a yearly fee, has a lot of bells and whistles, things about like um, you can add self-study plans, but the student has to have an account. Um, they are integrated with a thing called keys app and you can play for the student in real time but it needs a midi controller and while i have one it's an octave and change which means i can't really effectively play anything on it mm. for them in real time so it's sort of like well why i don't have the money why try to stretch to spend it um we talked about facetime but not every student has an apple product um talked about skype my experience with my in-laws in Africa a number of years back was that it was glitchy and frustrating and that seemed to still be the report on it. Um, what was the other? Somebody mentioned go to meeting um, but didn't seem excited about it. So it came down to Zoom because I already had it loaded on my computer. It was free since I was mostly doing one-to-one -one and um, and it was there. And then um, the, the advice was that the microphone on your computer if it's fairly recent, should be sufficient. I haven't found that's necessarily the case. Yeah. Um, I did have one student that we we had a discussion with their one of their their guardians with their grandparent who paid for the lessons, and um, we did end up needing to get them a mic, um, and it vastly improved the situation. I was lucky; I already had a blue Yeti mic, which is actually a podcast mic. Um, and people have different preferences on those too. You know, it's a it's a multi I think it's a multi-directional. I can't remember. And then there's like unidirectional. I like it because it gives a more three-dimensional sound. Um, it at least that's how I hear it. Um, and I had that. I got luck. I that was luck because I had taught sewing at Stephen Kate's camp, and they offload all their um, basically all their equipment at the end of each summer. And I had bought it a few years previous, so I already had that. Had my amp. Had my laptop. And I was lucky I already had this screen um, <laughs> so that I could keep my background simple and not distracting for my students or myself having ADHD. So um, that was, yeah, it kind of just, it, it fell together. I, I'm really grateful that it did, but um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I mean, I gave them instructions on equipment, but that's equipment on their, their end. I think it's just always going to be a struggle. Some of them I would really like, you know, it's like I told them not to use a, a tablet 
they use a tablet <laughs> to connect and it's like, well, you don't have the functionality, like you can't get the Zoom settings right because you have to turn off a lot of, that's the other thing about Zoom, you have to turn off a lot of things both on your on your operating system and on Zoom mm-hmm. so that it doesn't filter out singing because it thinks yeah. singing is a continuous noise and it's going to, it's it thinks it's just background noise and it cuts it out or turns down the volume. Um so yeah, I've had students where it's like, uh, can you like, yeah, it, it's, 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 but I, you just gotta let that go. Cause you can't, you can't control it. So you just do the best with what's in front of you on that day. I'd say at ACT, we had the kind of, you know, we're not for profit theater. So we had the technological infrastructure of one. I used to compare my not for profit computer to, um, like a delicate antebellum corseted lady who had to ref- like retire to the feigning couch at the merest hint of exertion, right? <laughs> like, um, and you know, we have somebody on our board who works for a tech company who uh, said that we've basically gone through the equivalent of 15 years of um, cultural change in terms of technology in our organization in, in a single year, right? Um, so we really had to get used to doing a lot of things that we were not used to. Um, uh, and we tried quite a few things that, you know, um, and, and are still experimenting actually. So, uh, yeah, so zoom, you know, um, we came to early, we tried Twitch for a little bit, you know, which didn't work as well for us for a couple of reasons. We had, um, we had to, Oh yeah, and we try. I thought I mentioned VMix. Um, we learned what was good and different for different things. We learned about what kind of thing. What like if we use VMix in certain ways, it would create a lag between sound and visual. Like Heather, we came, became very used to all of the back um, settings of Zoom, <laughs> and you know, and we're still looking for that. Um, piece of software that will allow for real-time um, collaboration musically with, you know, multiple instruments where you can hear well. We've used clean feed, which is better, but echoes can be a problem. So, you know, I have a, quite a few commissions that have um, music involved that I'm desperate to start workshopping again. And uh, I think we might have to wait until we have, um, until you know, until it's safe to gather in person to really be able to fully work on them. Although Stanford, I know, has actually developed a platform that will be available somewhat soon. So that's exciting. Um, I, I think I mentioned, you know, we had we had tested years ago, we had played with Skype and other um, distance learning things we had used. Um, uh, uh, we were using Wirecast to do some live feeding through um, that, and and we found that just Zoom was the easiest for our teachers and students to use. And so when when it was time, we were like, well, we know we want to go with Zoom. Um, and and uh, at the time, our institution wasn't using Zoom for internally; we were using WebEx. So it was kind of a we were balancing too, but eventually our institution went to Zoom, so that was good. Um, and then similarly with Thinkific, which was the online course. Um, the, the really the reason we were we were using Thinkific was because we had it was the cheapest for what we wanted at the time. We were like, we just want to start small and test our hand at this. And it was really cheap in 2019. You know, we looked at Coursera and a couple others and we're like, let's just go with Thinkific. And then like all of a sudden it was like, oh, now we have 40,000 users on this thing. Um, and we have to make sure it's COPA compliant. We have to do all this stuff on the back end that we weren't expecting to have to do. Um, but it's actually scaled really well for us. We've been really surprised with how well it, it worked. Um, but one of the things that was interesting to us is, you know, we integrate technology into what we do pretty regularly um, in terms of, of ed tech. And so in the beginning, we were like super divergent. We were like, let's use Nearpod and we'll use Flipgrid and we'll use Padlet and Jamboard and all this stuff. And then like, you know, we were, we were just throwing everything at the wall and then like, like within a few weeks, it was like, well, you know, Nearpod has this glitch and doesn't work well here. And, and you know, it's kind of annoying when you have to jump from here to Jamboard and back again. And so eventually we kind of just like started like slashing away at them and kind of converging into like really, you know, we can use Adobe Spark to make some 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 videos that are like easy for our staff to make and work really well. Um, and and uh, there's a website called Kiriki. K- 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 
it's like curriculum, but Kariki, C-U-R-R-I-K-I. And it has some um, some interesting tools for like embedding interactive content into um, these uh, online courses. And so we kind of started to focus in on, um, on, on you know, what do we really want to do? And, and similar to what Joy was saying, like, what's the best tool for, for what it is we're trying to do? And, and, um, and did a lot of editing. So that was, that was the big part, was really just editing out what's not working for us, what's just too complex for, for uh, what we're trying to do. Did you have anything to add on tools or process? So our main, so you, you're posting most of the tools that are out there. Actually, one of the things I just want to say is, is that the Google suite of tools, things like uh, all the different parts of Drive actually are amazingly useful um, in that they are, you know, don't always have all the same bells and whistles as other things, but students already, most students already have experience with them and that's a big advantage. So for example, on a PowerPoint activity, um, you know, uh, you know, using Google Slides, you can make an individual slide for every student and then you can have them just have editing rights and they can fill in. So if you like want them to interpret a graph, you can have a graph there. If you want to put a picture on it and have them circle the important parts of the picture, and then you can use the slide sorting feature, which is not really the purpose of the slide sorting feature, but because Google's engineers, they're like super hot. They made it so all the slides instantly update as the students, as someone is, you know, uh, working on a slide. So you can have like 30 slides being worked on at the same time and you can see them all simultaneously and then you can like jump around essentially from student to student better than you could if you were in the classroom, which is just an incredible feature. And so what we discovered, you know, at the Teacher Institute, all of us are former teachers. And so we think we are hot stuff when it comes to education. But we discovered this year that, you know, we've always been discovering that, you know, the people who are still in the classroom have skills that we don't have. But this year we discovered, we are really not the people who know the best. Like every one of our teachers has spent a year working online. They know a lot more than we do. And so they, we give them the opportunity to share their tips and tricks with each other. And they might not be the same as, you know, if you're a professional learning provider, they might not be the same as if you're someone else, but by being, uh, finding the people who are your peers and working with them, then you're gonna get the best ideas for similar sorts of things. If I can also just jump in, Helen, and, and talk about um, process, that was one of the things that actually was really helpful for us. Um, we just, before the pandemic, opened like this $60 million education center, and we had been like developing all these new programs and, you know, relaunching all these new, you know, so we had gone through this like two year program development process. And in that, one of the things that came out of that was um, we were doing, based on uh, Stanford D School Design Thinking, we were doing um, design uh, sprints and we were really using the agile process to do design sprints to create um, new programs. And one of the things that was super helpful was having that experience is when the pandemic hit, the reason we were able to get content out and develop so quickly is because we were using that agile sprint structure. And so we were able to really get like small groups of like teams of three staff members um, working and iterating very, very quickly um, to create this, these like high quality products. And so that was super helpful to us as well. That's great information. Um, and I see that there we have a question in the Q&A about um, whether you've noticed any differences or thought about things differently between live and recorded sessions. So what were the implications of those? I know it sounds like Joy, specifically with you, you started off with live and then maybe did more recording. Um, and this may also connect with kind of the idea of um, synchronous and asynchronous might scale better. So how did you think through these, um, these considerations? Well, so part of our um, pivoting to the pre-recorded is that, you know, we uh, offered some productions in a way where we had kind of live experiences, you know, where you could chat and, uh, like, you know, and kind of share a version of what you might have in a theater where, you know, you can hear other people laughing or gasping or, you know, um, with the chat. And then we'd also have an on-demand window. And we just found that everyone was kind of using the on-demand window that um, I think when it's delivered through a screen, uh, 
I think people are just so used to being able to access it at any time that that became really, really important. And the chat was kind of fun for us, but I think less interesting for our, um, for our patrons, right? They just kind of wanted to watch it to experience it. Um, but we're actually moving a little bit back to this live thing because what we tried to think about is like, okay, what can we offer that really feels demonstrably different from, you know, I don't know, streaming Bridgerton or some other, all of the forms of you know, entertainment that are available to us whenever we want very cheaply. Um, and we thought like one of the things that theaters offers is that idea of a relative intimacy of experience and that direct connection between performer and audience. And so um, with this show Communion by Chris Chen, um, we are going to be performing it live, you know, eight days a week and, um, or eight performances a week, uh, and, but it's structured to be interactive so that hopefully, you know, not forced interaction, people will have an option, you know, but, um, but hopefully that there's a little bit of that sense of that, uh, like combining what we learned about how wonderfully open people have been in the discussions about the work in their home setting with, you know, hopefully the ease of access, um, and, um, and, and some of what you might get in a live experience that maybe you don't get in the live experience of something that isn't as in structured explicitly to be interactive. I really, like most of us at the Exploratory, I'm, am I cutting into someone else? Sorry, but the, the, the um, you know, I, I didn't get into teaching because I wanted to be a television performer. And like the lack of feedback that you can't get, like you heard me a few months ago talking to the screen saying, which way is mirror Zeke pointing? I know, you know, luckily Helen and Pauline were sort of nodding and maybe they were pointing as well. Two people I have feedback from, but it's very difficult without that kind of uh, uh, response. And the teachers, of course, have this as a real problem. Lots of students for a variety of reasonable reasons have their cameras turned off. So they're like, very much being like a TV performer, performing to the unblinking eye and getting so little uh, emotional feedback. And that's why a lot of us went into the profession. And I'm sure that that's true for actors, right? I mean, would you rather be on a stage or would you rather be like talking to a camera? And that is uh, such a, a, a change that I think that a lot of people have really struggled with that. And the experience is so different as well, so. Um, I'm sure that that's, you know, even the best recorded production. Like, I, I went to see a stand up comic online recently. Um, and I have no idea if that person's actually a good comic because it was impossible without the audience. Like, you never, stand up comics are always shot in front of them. You know, if you really see a video, it's front of an audience. So I can't imagine how difficult that is. Yeah, I was thinking, Zeke, earlier when you were talking about um, kind of your wife and how she has structured her teaching differently, I was thinking about um, some of the research pre-pandemic around flipped teaching and that idea of, um, you know, what, what, what can you do alone versus what is it really helpful to have other people around you for? And so we've really tried to lean into that in terms of like when we have our students come together, we want them talking to each other. We don't want to be presenting to them to 30 teenagers. We want them to be engaging with one another because that's what they can't do alone. Like we can send them a video of us talking um, or, or sharing content to some degree, right? Um, and so, you know, we can do breakout rooms and we can do this other stuff. And so we're really trying to lean into, um, you know, what is, what is the the best you know mode for what it is what our goals are for that particular session um while at the same time recognizing that you know when you do something live there's limitations so we're trying to cap our live sessions so we only have 30 or 40 participants so they can be more collaborative and engaging which means we can only you know hit a certain number of, of folks and so if if we want to hit more folks then we then we're doing things asynchronously so that we can have you know thousands upon thousands accessing it so it's it's you know all of those things kind of taking it into account If I could mention one more, I'm so sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier, but we had a play that we've intended to do since before COVID um, called Animal Wisdom. And this is, uh, it's an incredibly moving piece. 
uh, that I that I've gotten to see live. It's from Heather Christian, who's this incredible, like brilliant, brilliant artist. Um, and it's engaging. There's there's a story to it, but there's also an element of ritual. Um, and when I saw it in performance, it was among the most moving things I've ever experienced. Uh, music involved, all of that. So we tried to figure out, like, we really want to do this show. So how can we do it? And so we. Uh, entered into a partnership with Willie Mammoth Theater in DC, which is actually something that's been nice about um, COVID. It's, it's very easy to partner across distance, right? Um, and uh, originally the plan was, you know, before we knew <laughs> like how long everything would take, that, that it would be a live performance that we would capture and make available digitally as well, right? Um, but of course, as the year progressed, we realized that no, we're not we're not going to be able to have a live audience at all. And in fact, we had to cut down on the size of the um, team making it and, and kind of distribute them into different rooms uh, because the uh, because we went back down in tiers, right? <laughs> like I mean, but um, but so we've pivoted and it's actually we've made it into this really beautiful. It's a film. Um, that's been made that's incredibly beautiful. I just saw a rough cut of it last week and it's incredibly moving. And we're thinking about like ways, like I think, you know, we've tried to preserve the ritual aspect, fe ritualistic feel of the production in the film, but we're also going to ask people to like turn off their lights and before they watch it and to, and to create the conditions for entering into that kind of ritualistic space by individual preparation. So I'm really hoping that again, we can have that sense of connection um, in a very different way. And I think, I think that this play is going to be incredibly healing actually in this, in this year to come and, and kind of unlike anything else that you can experience. So that's going to be available, uh, soon in, in, in April, like, sorry, in, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, you can find out about that on our website, but it, I think it's going to be beautiful not to be missed. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate all of you spending your time with us today and sharing what you've done um, uh, to pivot. And I think that everyone on this call can um, it has empathy and great respect for your creativity and, um, and taking the time to share with us today. I would love all of you um, to go ahead and post any links so that we can keep up with you in the chat. And um, we really appreciate the time that you've donated uh, um, to us today. Thank you so much. And um, just, we look forward to seeing what all of your organizations do going forward because um, they've been impressive this far and we can continue to learn from them uh, as we head back to in-person and continue keeping the things that work um, online. I would like to end on one last reflection that um, is sort of coming from one of the themes that Joyce said. We've heard today from those who reach individuals to small groups to thousands of people online. And all of you, each and every one of you has had to stretch your creativity and make major adjustments in your workflow to maintain that connection that Joy has been talking about. So I wanna thank each of you from the bottom of my heart um, for connecting with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, fellow panelists. This has been so exciting to hear what you've done and your creativity. I think it's great meeting all of you. Thank you. For those of you watching, um, for our participants, we will be posting this recording online on the CRIME website, which is being shared right now. And I want to thank all of you for joining. Uh, 